Hello, and welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation's Wellness Wednesday program. Today's presentation is Next Step in Care, Seeking Outside Help. I'm Ashley Choi, Community Program Manager for the Great Lakes Chapter of the Parkinson's Foundation, and I'm happy to be your moderator for today's program. Today's program is being recorded and will be available for viewing on Parkinson's Foundation YouTube channel within a few days. Before we begin, we want to welcome those who are joining us for the very first time. So take a moment to share the mission of the Parkinson's Foundation. Every day in everything we do, we are working to make life better for people with Parkinson's disease. To achieve our mission, we pursue three goals. First, to improve care for everyone in Parkinson's. Second, advance research toward a cure. And lastly, empower and educate our global community. Today's program is a great example of one of the things we're doing to help us meet these goals. PD Health at Home is presented by the Light of Day Foundation. Their generosity has made today's programming possible. Thank you to the Light of Day Foundation for your support. I am now pleased to introduce our speakers, Rose Wickman and Joan Gartner. Rose and Joan work together at the Strutters Parkinson Center, a center of excellence under the Parkinson's Foundation in Golden Valley and St. Paul, Minnesota. Rose Wickman is the director of a Parkinson's program at Strutters Parkinson Centers at both locations. And Joan Gartner is a nurse clinician and co-coordinator at Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence. Together, they created and developed the Strutters Parkinson's Care Network. Before I turn it over to Rose and Joan for their presentation, I want to remind everyone that you can submit your questions at any time by clicking on the Q&A icon in the black banner on the bottom of your viewing page. Rose, you can go ahead and share your slides now. Hello, everyone. Hope you can hear us. Um, Joan, did you want to get started? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Joan Gardner. As Ashley introduced, I am a registered nurse and nurse clinician, and I've had the privilege of working with um, families and um, health professionals um, in the Parkinson's realm for over 25 years. And I'm Rose Wickman. I'm the director at Struthers Parkinson Center, a physical therapist by background. Um, as uh, they mentioned in the introduction, um, Joan and I, for the last nine years now, have embarked on a journey of working very closely with outside agencies in making sure that home care agencies, senior living communities, and others um, really understand Parkinson's disease. So we've had a lot of experience in this realm and we're looking forward to sharing what, what we've learned with you today. Um, I think one of the things that I would just like to point out before we get started is I think this is a really timely conversation. I think the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has really affected us all. But in particular, I think it's caused a lot of isolation and kind of uh, some fear and trepidation about reaching out and seeking outside help. Very difficult to think about having either someone come into your home or transitioning to another living community, living setting, if indeed, um, you know, with COVID-19 so present. So I think it's a timely conversation. I'm glad and hope that uh, hopeful that people are moving forward on getting their vaccines and that we are going to be able to open up the country and the world a little bit more and we'll be able to um, look at outside help in a slightly different way. So the first thing that I would like to talk about is the fact that seeking outside help is really a difficult topic. And I think we need to acknowledge that. There's a lot of um, concern that goes into this kind of a conversation for a family, both for a care recipient, someone who's living with Parkinson's, as well as for family care partners. Um, I think hopefully most of you who are um, listening to this webinar today are doing this in terms of planning. 
don't wait until there's a crisis. It's really important to have early conversations about potential plans. Um, uh, no one has a crystal ball. No one knows who will need what, when. So I think it's important to kind of discuss many different scenarios of how you might use outside help and care and to learn what the options really are before you need them. A crisis is not the time to have to make decisions and may not afford you the ability to really make the choice you would prefer to because you haven't planned in advance. So we always say that you should consider several scenarios when you're thinking about outside help. One is you should be considering some plans if the care, what I'll say care recipient, the individual with Parkinson's, if they need additional help if they need some kind of help at home or a transition to another care setting, um, what would the plan look like if that person needed the help? But we also have to consider what would the plan be if the person who's um, serving as the care partner or caregiver, whatever um, term you prefer to use, we need to know a scenario if they need additional help. Um, caregivers are not impervious to um, problems, medical concerns, other things that may come up. And we need to have a plan in place if that care uh, partner was not able to provide support and assistance, what would the plan look like? And then you need a third plan. You need a third plan of what would occur if both the care recipient, the person with Parkinson's and the family caregiver needed additional help if there was some kind of a transition that may be happening together, maybe a move to a new living setting or additional services coming into the home to impact or affect and help both the person with Parkinson's and the family care partner. So I think it's really important to consider all the scenarios because you don't know which one you may need until the time you need it. The last thing I would say about kind of this difficult topic is I would really encourage everyone to avoid making promises. This is a really easy thing to do. Oh, I promise I will never have someone else come into the home. I will always be the person who provides you assistance and support. Or I promise we never have to move from our current living setting. That may indeed be true, but it may not. And it's very difficult, I think, to make promises about what uh, someone may or may not need in the future. As I said a little earlier, no one has that crystal ball. We can't predict the future. And I think to discuss a lot of different options makes a lot of sense and not think there's only going to be one way to do things and try to avoid making promises like that. We have Joan talk uh, next about some reasons to consider outside help. Joan, you're muted. In thinking about um, when or how to get outside help, um, let's first think about those of you that are planning to stay in your home. Um, some things to might that you might want to consider um, for making staying staying at home a little bit easier. Um, so I invite you to think about or even make a list of things that you do on a daily, a weekly, a monthly basis that are routine. They just cycle through and you do them over and over. Seeking help for these really simple routine activities can really reduce stress for both the caregiver and the care recipient um, and leave more time for other um, tasks or um, even better for other socialization and times to just enjoy one another. Um, so in thinking about some of these routine things, maybe it is ordering groceries or prescriptions online. Curbside pickup has become a normal um, phrase within many of our homes um, during the pandemic. And so taking advantage of curbside pickup, arranging for assistance with routine cleaning or routine yard work like mowing or um, raking or snow removal, gutter cleaning. Um, 
thinking about um, that on another level, would there be a, a friend, a neighbor, or some paid help that can go and pick up your curbside pickup groceries or stop at the pharmacy um, for your prescriptions and then come home and put the groceries away? Um, arranging for someone else to take the, your, the um, person with Parkinson's to the barber shop or the beauty salon, if that's an ongoing thing that happens. And then you think about medical transportation. In every community, the um, metavans have a different term, but um, looking into how to get to appointments in an easier way. Um, even if you do drive, it might be easiest to have a medivan come and pick up you and your loved one for a medical appointment. When we think about Parkinson's disease and the, the symptoms that um, Parkinson's can present, we know that social isolation can really occur. And we know we've had a lot of social isol isolation within the last year. And so bringing somebody into the home, some paid help, some paid companionship, um, really can widen your social circle and provide increased stimulation and cognitive and emotional um, support. And then we know that caregiving can really take a physical toll on the caregiver or the care partner. And so we know that assistance with activities of daily living like bathing and dressing is probably the most frequent reason people decide to bring, bring help into the home to offer assistance. Removing some of those weekly tasks can really offer the caregiver a break from the physical and emotional routine um, of caregiving. Next slide. Um, thinking about caregiver giver respite, uh, again, especially um, with advancing Parkinson's disease, we know that there is an endless task list of tasks to do um, for the caregiver. And um, that obviously contributes to caregiver burnout and caregiver strain. And so again, planning ahead, thinking ahead to, um, of some of the routine activities um, such as running errands or attending appointments um, makes a big difference if you bring help in to help with that. Caregivers also should consider taking time for themselves. And boy, we know that that is way easier said than done. Um, but really, if you reserve time for yourself as the caregiver or the care partner, um, even um, for taking time away, even if it's to go and stay in your house and shut the door to a room and read a book or take a nap, um, some caregivers have decided to pay for outside help to come in um, during the nighttime so that they can get a good night's sleep. And we know what a good night's sleep does emotionally and physically for ourselves. Thinking about unplanned medical needs, things just happen. We know accidents happen. Maybe it's a fall. Maybe it's a change. Um, in health, maybe as Rose said, it's a change in the health of the caregiver. So again, planning ahead um, uh, about what, what your needs might be and where you might wanna go if you have sudden changes. Um, we'll talk some about some of the resources available later on in our presentation. Um, and then we know that with um, some of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease might um, require that the person has more supervision, that that caregiver, care partner can provide on an ongoing basis. So that's another perfect um, reason why individuals might consider bringing in some outside help just to kind of um, broaden the help and broaden the base and the platform of, of who can give be resources to your loved one with Parkinson's disease. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about what kind of assistance is really available. And the good news is there's lots of different levels of assistance. But sometimes it can be very confusing about what is it that I really want or what is it that I really need? 
So let's talk about the various levels of assistance, what some of these terms mean, and just give you kind of a walk through kind of the network of services available to people. I think the first type of assistance is something that we probably all know about, but we need to make sure that we keep track of, and that is our informal network. You know, uh, sometimes it's the people who say, you know, is there anything I can do to help you? Um, or what can I do? And I think frequently the response to that from a family care partner is, oh, nothing, we're fine, kind of thing. But usually when someone is asking what they can do to help, they really want to know. And it can be helpful to have actually a, a list or something in place so that you have a few things that might be helpful for you um, if someone provided that assistance. It might be, as Joan mentioned earlier, going to pick up the groceries, or it might be picking up a prescription when they're out and about. It might be taking your car to get the oil changed. So that's something that you don't have to do. Um, it could be a neighbor, it could be a friend, it could be a relative. Um, Joan and I always love the story of someone that we knew um, who had a calendar. And at the end of, uh, toward the end of every year during the holiday season, as friends and family would gather, Frequently, the question was, what can I do? And she had her calendar and she would say, okay, I have a book club once a month. I go out for lunch with a friend. I like to go to see the movies. I, she had this list of kind of standing things she wanted to do. And she passed around the calendar and said, okay, sign up. You can uh, be here with my loved one, with my husband. Um, who has Parkinson's and really can't be alone, but and her friends and neighbors and relatives just kind of signed up for that. Um, it did not cost her anything. They were happy to do it. And it was a great kind of informal network. Now, there are also computer apps out there now where there's different signups for sheets um, uh, that you can, uh, you know, utilize calendars of those kinds of things as well. But don't forget your informal networks. Sometimes people kind of have a little job jar. And, you know, so when someone says, is there something I can do today? You can pull that out and say, well, you know, I really just need this taken care of in my garage, or I really just need this taken, this errand run. People are willing to do that. And I would very much encourage you to use your informal network whenever you can. I should also mention that another informal network that many people use is their faith community. And that might also be another option to consider in an informal network. Sometimes you just have a lot of chores or kind of the day-to-day -day cleaning that's hard to keep up on because you have other responsibilities as a family care partner. You may not need home care services. In that case, it might be a housekeeping service who maybe comes and just does a good cleaning or a once over of your house every other week or every third week that kind of just helps you keep up on that. Or it may be uh, you know, something like a, a handyman service who's gonna help you do things like clean gutters or shovel snow or take care of the lawn. But those kind of services are out there and available. Again, not considered home care services, but are many, many jobs out there and services out there and available. Now, there may be a need for your loved one with Parkinson's to um, have more uh, structured activity through the day. Maybe they're becoming more isolated. Maybe a care partner needs time away, a day off, so to speak, to do the things they need to do. Many, many people use adult day services programs. Adult day services are licensed programs, typically licensed by the state. And it's where people will go and spend anywhere, usually from four to eight hours um, here at Struthers Parkinson Center in Minneapolis, we have an adult day program that's just for people with Parkinson's. More often, they involve mostly seniors um, of, of varying um, degrees of, of disability or 
difficulties. But the adult day service programs run wonderful groups. They typically serve meals and have a host of activities for someone to participate in. Here at Struthers, our adult day program has everything from uh, horticulture therapy, gardening, music therapy, discussion groups, art programs, et cetera. Everybody has different personal taste, but adult day is one way that you know that your loved one can be safe. Adult day services are typically on a per fee, uh, per day structure. Um, sometimes there's some help through state funded programs to cover some of those services depending on income. And there are some VA benefits that also cover adult day services. Not everyone is fortunate enough to have long-term care insurance. If you are fortunate enough to have long-term care insurance, adult day services are often a covered benefit of that policy. So that's adult day. But if you're not interested in going out to getting care, you might be more looking at home care, bringing someone into the home, a licensed professional worker to take care of or provide support to a loved one with Parkinson's disease. Now there's a couple different kinds of home care agencies. And so it's kind of confusing for people. So they generally, home care agencies fall into two categories. One is called Medicare certified. What that is typically provides is what is referred to as skilled care, typically after an illness, an injury, or a hospitalization. Nursing care, physical, occupational, or speech therapies, those kinds of things are under Medicare certified home care. Now, in order to qualify for Medicare certified home care, you need to be homebound, meaning you're not able to go out to appointments easily um, and that you're requiring services to be provided to you in your home. Medicare certified home care is just that, it's covered under your Medicare benefit. It is typically short-term, it is not something that's long-term forever, but that's what a Medicare certified home care agency offers. Now, there's another grouping of home care agencies, typically referred to as non-medical or non-certified. And it's really, that's a kind of a misnomer. They do provide some kind of basic services if someone needs assistance, for example, with a bath or a shower or with getting dressed. Those kinds of things can easily be covered at, through a non-medical home care agency. They also can provide the companionship and socialization that someone may need when a care partner goes out. They may be uh, an individual that comes to the home to help with an exercise program or to go for a walk or to hold conversation. They may do light cleaning. Um, typically they're not housekeeping services, but they might provide light housekeeping as part of the non-medical services as well. So that type of home care is typically per, uh, is, is a fee per hour. Um, many agencies have a, um, a limit or a, a cap on providing services. Some provide 24 hour live-in services. Others have a minimum of a three hour visit. So you have to do your homework when you're working with non-medical home care agencies. Find out what their parameters and limitations are and what kind of services they're able to provide. Let's move on now and talk about other kinds of assistance that are outside of your home. Joan mentioned that if um, a caregiver may be, or excuse me, a, a person has an illness or an injury and may be hospitalized, not the caregiver, but the person with Parkinson's, Say, you know, heaven forbid someone takes a fall and has a fracture, or maybe they've gotten sick and they have pneumonia, and they're really not ready to come back home after their hospital stay. They need some shorter term care and some rehab to get better and get stronger. That's typically referred to as transitional care, 
sometimes people say a TCU stay, transitional care unit, or sometimes it's called a rehab stay. A rehab stay is covered by Medicare after a period of hospitalization for a limited period of time. And the person must meet certain parameters to qualify for that rehab stay. A rehab stay, a person must be able to tolerate therapies, typically three hours a day of physical, occupational, and or speech therapy in order to qualify for a Medicare rehab stay. But then there's also services provided. Many times a long-term care or what some people call a nursing home or a skilled nursing facility has a certain wing designated as a short-term rehab stay unit. So that's what a transitional care unit is. If someone is seeking longer term placement, not a short term stay, then they might consider the next step, which would be assisted living. An assisted living facility is typically a, a, an apartment type building where each person has their own unit, typically more like a studio apartment, but they're in their own space although the meals tend to be congregate. There's a congregate dining space where people go. And in assisted living, a variety of services can be provided. Assistance with medications, assistance with walking or going to the bathroom or other activities of daily living. Now, assisted living is a bit different too. They're all slightly different facilities. Some, have a flat rate fee per month. Others are a rental fee plus any services that that individual might need might be added on to that bill. And it's kind of based on what people need. So that is an assisted living building. Typically those kinds of facilities are not covered under Medicare. They typically can be covered through a long-term care insurance policy. So next on the list is residential homes. What's a residential home? A residential home, they're kind of springing up all over the country. They're a small home, typically in a neighborhood, um, a, a small residence, where usually anywhere from four to, usually four to six or four to eight people live in that home. Each person has a bedroom and then they share common living room, kitchen, dining room. It's like living in a house, but each person has their own bedroom space. They are a type of assisted living, just a much smaller environment. And some people find that smaller, more specialized environment, a better fit for what they're seeking. Some, not all, some residential uh, homes do accept um, policies, long-term care insurance policies, or state waiver programs um, for people who are uh, getting ready to qualify for medical assistance, but not everybody accepts that. So that's a residential home, a small, more intimate setting. Memory care units are typically within an assisted living facility. And a memory care unit is just that. It's, it serves clients who are having more difficulties with thinking skills, cognitive change, dementia, memory loss. Now, not everyone with Parkinson's is experiencing those problems, but many people with Parkinson's can develop these thinking changes. A memory care unit offers a more secure environment for someone who may have thinking changes. Typically, the entrances to memory care units are secured to reduce the risk of someone wandering. They typically have a slightly higher staffing ratio and they offer programs that are more specialized to people who have thinking changes or dementia. And then the last type of assistance is something that we've probably all heard of, long-term care. Again, some people say skilled nursing facility, some people say nursing home. Um, those are in places where individuals live. Many people now in, in long-term care have their own room. 
Sometimes rooms are shared in a long-term care environment. There is nursing 24 seven. If someone has a lot of skilled or specialized medical needs, they may need the services of long-term care. Long-term care, again, can be covered through a long-term care insurance policy, through private pay services, and many long-term care environments also accept medical assistance if someone is not able, because their funds are depleted, they may not be able to continue to pay for skilled nursing facility care. So those are the various types of assistance that are available. That's a lot to consider, but it's important to kind of know what's out there and what you're really looking for. So um, we've, we've gotten a lot of information um, to really clarifying what some of the different options for care are, bringing help into the home or making a transition to another living environment. So even if you don't expect to transition um, in living environment in the near future, it can be a good idea to start to visit facilities before a move is required. That will kind of help you, um, starting early will kind of help you get to know what's available in your community and, or your area, just in case you have to make a quick, quick decision, um, such as an unplanned medical um, need as we've talked about earlier. And certainly keep in mind that ultimately, your options may depend on availability of an apartment or a room at the time you need it, um, and your finances. It's really advisable if you do choose to go and start to visit some care communities to take somebody along with you, a family member whose opinion you trust, a friend, somebody that will be honest and open with you as you're, as you're going and touring these um, new, new communities. And then some um, families that Rose and I have talked to said, yes, we went and took a tour, a planned tour, but then we went back in an evening or on a weekend to really see what was going on at that, at that community at a different time when they didn't know we were coming. Um, so when we think about what do families think about when making a choice to move to another living environment? Certainly location, 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 right? You want a place that if your loved one with Parkinson's is moving to a, a new environment and the caregiver maybe is staying in at the home, we want to make sure that the caregiver can get there easily. Um, is it an in an accessible area of town? Um, some people in, in more metropolitan areas don't like to drive downtown. And so they would prefer a care community that's more in a rural setting. Um, do you feel comfortable coming and going? Does the neighborhood seem safe if you would need to visit um, after hours or when the sun sets? Um, those are just things to think about. Um, thinking about the level of care provided is really important. So it's the situation that you have now with care needs, but how do we anticipate care needs that might come down the pike later? As Rose said at the outset, we don't unfortunately have that crystal ball, but we do know that Parkinson's symptoms typically advance over time, right? And so thinking about services, um, does, the, does the community that you're visiting have a care continuum so that as there's advancing needs, um, can, you, can your loved ones stay where they are and just add on services to accommodate their care needs? Um, as Rose said, assisted livings really vary um, state by state sometimes. And so really asking the, the questions about, well, what about level of care? What if my loved one needs a, more than one person to assist them to get into bed or out of a chair? Um, does your, will your staff be able to, to um, accommodate a two person assist? What if there might be a, a need for a, a lift of some kind, either to stand? Um, would your care community allow that? 
or if there is a higher level of care than your community um, that you're visiting can provide, would you be allowed to hire in extra help just to accommodate care needs, allowing that person to stay where they are? So those are certainly some things to think about. And then just thinking about beyond care, um, what, what things are available day to day um, to really promote socialization, to really support um, independence and support dignity? Um, what Are there exercise classes that are really conducive to somebody living with Parkinson's disease? Um, seated exercise, is, is, would, might that be available? Do, does the site offer rehab on site? Or do they contract with a certain rehab company to bring in help if, if your loved one would have that need for skilled rehab during while they're living in this new care environment? Um, what about transportation? Um, would there be transportation to medical appointments? Um, or would there be um, regular shopping um, trips to the grocery store or to a, a local shopping area? Or even better yet, are there planned outings to museums or the Arboretum or to a park or to a theater um, that you could take advantage of um, really to, to expand your social, social um, connections? Those would all be things to think, to think about. Um, in an emergency, could your loved one be taken to a preferred hospital? Or would they only um, transport to hospitals that, that are in a certain geographical reason? So, so some lots of choices, lots of things to think about. Um, next slide, please. Okay, well, uh, there's a lot of things to think about. Probably one of the very important things to think about that we have not yet addressed, it's kind of the elephant in the room, is what is the awareness and the education of Parkinson's disease for staff who may be working within a facility or in within a home care agency for that matter. Um, in particular, if someone is um, in a care setting in a community and someone else is taking over administering Parkinson medications, do they understand the importance of the need for pills on time with Parkinson's? Now you've probably all heard that the federal laws say that uh, the person administering a, a pill has an hour before or an hour after that scheduled time to give that pill and still have it considered on time. Those of you who are savvy about Parkinson's disease know that that does not work well for an individual living with Parkinson's. And it's so important that people with Parkinson's receive their pills on time, every time. I know with Joan and I working with the CARE Network, it's one of the things that we talk about the most with, with uh, senior living communities and to educate nurses and other people doing the medication passes about that really important piece about people receiving their pills on time. So to make sure that they are aware of that and that they're asking those questions or that they seem to understand that. Do they understand Parkinson's symptoms? Not everyone understands on and off the motor fluctuations that can happen with Parkinson's. And people who don't understand that can sometimes unfortunately give people with Parkinson's a bad rap. People might get called stubborn or manipulative. You know, I saw you walk down the hall at 10, why can't you do it at noon? Well, it might be motor fluctuations, ons and offs. And staff need to understand that that can be part of Parkinson's disease. So making sure that perhaps that this senior community has had individuals with Parkinson's living there, that they have had some education, and that they understand the, those important nuances of Parkinson's is extremely important when you're making a choice. You probably already know, but I will take the time to mention that um, 
the Parkinson's Foundation does have the great Aware in Care kits. Those um, are designed to help educate health professionals about the importance of Parkinson's pills on time. And those free kits are available through the Parkinson Foundation information line. So I won't say more about that today, but just know that that exists and it can help you. They're designed and were initially designed for hospitalization, but if someone's moving to a senior living community, that can also be a time where people may need that education. Another real consideration that we can't get away from is the consideration of cost, the realities of budget. We all might have our ideal setting that we would want for our loved one or for ourselves, but a lot of that may have to do with your budget and to ask the right questions about that budget. Is there a flat rate fee? Are there added costs based on the cares provided? And if there are added costs, what are those costs? Do you have the opportunity to see a list of those costs? Do you have an opportunity to know what you're going to be charged on a monthly basis? Uh, is it in black and white? Are you able to see it on an invoice or on um, a statement of some kind? I think those kinds of considerations are extremely important. And then knowing how funding may happen. If someone may initially have some limited funds, but they know the funds are limited and in the future, they may need to be able to have either state funding or medical assistance programs providing some of their care needs. Do the senior living communities that you are seeking, do they have that available? Many do accept what are referred to as waiver programs or medical assistance, but some do not. And it's very important to ask those questions up front so that you know that if your private pay funding is depleted, are you able to stay in the community that you've chosen or would another move be necessary? It may also be worth seeking uh, to find out what your VA benefits. If you are a veteran, what your VA benefits may cover. There are, for example, long-term care facilities that are run through the Veterans Administration that are available to veterans at very limited costs. And so that is something if someone is really looking into finding care with limited funding, it may be an option. So you want to look at all of those things as you're looking forward to making a choice. Hey, some other things to consider. Um, when an apartment or room becomes available, um, what should you think about? Um, where is that room in relationship to where the activities are held or where the dining room is? Is it a far walk that would be difficult for your loved one um, or, or is it close by? What's the noise level? Um, even thinking about what floor is it on, does, would, your, would you or your loved one need to get into an elevator to go up to a second, third, or fourth um, floor? Um, as we know, with freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease, sometimes going in and off of an elevator can be difficult. Um, Thinking about the physical environment, what is the flooring? Um, Rose and I have seen some pretty crazy carpet in our days, um, and sometimes carpet can really um, cause freezing um, visually, um, making it difficult for somebody to get from one area to another. So those are some things to think about. Um, thinking about staffing levels, um, Rose already mentioned that in a long-term care community, a nursing home, they do have nurses available 24, um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But in assisted living, um, that usually is not the case. Um, they have nurses on staff during the daytime and sometime limited hours in the evening shift. But overnight, usually there, um, that person, there is not a nurse available. And so would that meet the needs of your loved one or would it not? 
Um, thinking about what's the asking the staffing ratio, how many um, residents do, is one nursing assistant responsible for, um, and really getting getting to that difficult question. Does the staffing change overnight? What's the ratio of residents to nursing assistants in the nighttime hours? Um, are important considerations because we know about bladder changes, um, urinary frequency and urgency in Parkinson's that, that certainly will probably um, overnight um, help assistance will probably be inevitable. Um, is there consistent, consistent staffing within an area or a wing of the assisted living or long-term care community? Or is the staff really constantly coming and going and rotating? Because we know that um, staff, when staff can get to know an individual and individual needs, it's probably optimum um, for everybody. And um, uh, obviously, the approachability. What's your gut sense about the approachability of staff um, during your tour? Um, can you watch people interacting with others? Do they seem to listen? Do, do you get the sense that they want to be your partner in care? Um, Again, Rose and I have talked to countless um, families and countless healthcare professionals. And sometimes the health professional is saying, well, we're taking over the care now, right? Um, and most families don't want that kind of a partnership. They really want to continue to be involved in care, they want to be appreciated for the years of care provided at home and the insight that they have to what the unique needs of their loved one are when it comes to Parkinson's disease. So what's your gut about staff willingness to hear your point of view would be, um, would be important considerations. Next slide, please. So there are all of these questions to consider. And I, I think, um, as Joan is saying, the communication with you as a family member or a caregiver is extremely important. So some questions to ask is, how will I find things out? When will you communicate with me? How often will you communicate with me? Uh, are you listening to what I'm telling you? Is, is my input as a family care partner valued and accepted and adapted into a plan of care? You need to feel heard. And as Joan said, you have to go with your gut. That's not one that's very easy just to check off on a list. You have to talk to people and you have to kind of get a feel for that. And then also to kind of get a feel for how a community may consider a person as a unique individual and what accommodations and what kinds of, of preferences they have and how they can best care for the person as an individual and not make assumptions that this person's going to like what everybody else likes. Um, it, it may have to be something as practical as, you know, if uh, someone, uh, who, what is the language that's spoken primarily at that site? Uh, is, is, if someone is, English is not their first language and English is the only language that's spoken there, maybe that's not the right place. Uh, maybe if English is the language that your loved one speaks and most of the staff does not speak English, that's good, might be a problem as well. So it's, it's important to kind of look at that and then also just kind of the individual personal preferences that the person has. What is their routine? Are they typically a late riser? Uh, do they like to be up at night? Are, they, um, you know, are there certain activities that they would like to continue? Those are very important considerations that sometimes we can forget and should not be overlooked as we're considering a, a transition in care. So the hard reality of this change, if, if um, you're moving to a new care environment, and, and as we said earlier, 
sometimes just the person with Parkinson's moves, especially if it's a long-term long -term care community, um, even in assisted living, sometimes just the, the person with Parkinson's moves, sometimes the couple moves to a new um, assisted living environment. Um, but the fact of the matter is any kind of a move we know is difficult. Um, moving without Parkinson's disease is difficult. So just the, the realization and really conversations about that things are not going to be as they were. Um, change is difficult for both um, care partner and care recipi recipient. And certainly there is going to be um, a period of adjustment as others become involved. Initially, when your loved one makes that transition, it's really important for the care partner or family member to be on top of potential errors that can occur. Um, it historically transitions in care are the time where errors can be made, especially in medications. Rose already talked about the unique care needs of people with Parkinson's disease, especially around medication management. That isn't only pills on time, but that's how medications are documented within the medical record so that the, your loved one can get their pills on time. So um, getting out of the habit of saying, my loved one takes carbidopa, levodopa four times a day, but instill, instead saying, my loved one takes carbidopa, levodopa at eight, 12, four and eight, give specific times and make sure those times are written down by your care community. So keeping on, on top of medications. Now, that being said, there will be adjustments. So we know that stress makes Parkinson's symptoms worse. And this will be a stressful time for your loved one with Parkinson's disease. So even with pills giving being given according to the schedule on time every time, there's Parkinson's symptoms might seem less under control and that's the effect of stress. So just to be aware of that, that this is a transition time, it's an adjustment time, and to um, acknowledge that. Um, certainly ask questions, make sure meds are given on time, but, but realize that could be your reality. Um, you know, you're going to probably double, you know, think about, you know, did I, did we make the right choice? Did we choose the right care community? There will be frustration, as um, Rose mentioned, the communication patterns for what you would like and what they can give you kind of get to a level playing ground. Um, so there might be some, some guilt on your part for, for making the change, but just ride it out, give it some time. Um, and know that uh, that transition and adjustment period, allow that for yourself, allow that to happen for yourself. Next slide, please. Well, the last slide just talks about other resources that can provide you with some assistance as you're making these decisions about outside help. Um, hopefully we've given you some things to think about today, but there's a lot to think about. So if you're needing follow-up, local social workers are excellent sources of information, particularly about particular agencies or communities in your area. Social workers can be accessed through the county. Many hospitals have social workers and the Parkinson Foundation Centers of Excellence like Struthers Parkinson Center have social workers that can assist in providing additional information. The Parkinson's Foundation info line is another place to ask questions. And then there are, is this group of individuals you may or may not be familiar with that are called senior housing locators. These are free services. They help to explain the options. They will help you tour facilities and they will provide some resources to you. Now, you don't pay a senior housing locator. 
those companies are paid by the facilities that they're working with. And so they don't show you just one. They're not trying to make you go just to one place, but they're, they actually receive a locator fee, so to speak, from uh, groups that you may choose to, to go into or join. So you don't have to pay a fee for a senior housing locator. And then the last thing I'll mention, and we'll open it up for questions, is the Struthers Parkinson's Care Network that Joan and I work with. Um, it's grown into a national organization and is currently in about 14 states. The website um, is on the screen there, and that just lists uh, places that have taken steps to train their staff about Parkinson's disease. So hopefully these are helpful resources and that we had good information to share. Um, Parkinson's Foundation has great resources. I mentioned the info line. There is also a book called Caring and Coping that has some lists of some of the things we talked about today that you might wanna refer to and get a free copy by contacting the info line. So thank you very much. We'll, we'll open it up for questions. Hey, yeah, you're muted. Yeah. Apologize. Um, thank you both for a very informative presentation. We received quite a few questions through the registration and through our live audience today. So let's just jump right in. Um, if you have submitted a question, we would do our best to get to them in the remaining time. I know we're already getting to the top of the hour, so we'll try to get to a few. So the first question I had was, what if my loved one is resistant? to in-home care. Um, so they've already expressed that they needed the support and help, but they're kind of um, not wanting to bring someone in yet. It's a, it, it's a, I wish I had a, a good, strong, easy answer to that. Um, I think that we see that, um, that sometimes people are resistant to care. I think to try and be open and honest about what you as a care partner need to uh, in order for the situation to continue to work. It can sometimes be helpful to have a full family meeting and not just have a conversation among just the one care give, primary caregiver and the care recipient to really help people understand. And uh, again, uh, make sure that there's a lot of conversation about it and that it's not just coming from one, one source. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, what are some strategies for a low-income senior living alone and without family? How early in the disease should we start planning? So I know you talked about doing planning before crisis, right? So where could they go, especially if they're alone and without that kind of um, social network of care providers? I think, uh, again, that's a difficult uh, a situation. Planning early certainly makes sense. I think connecting with um, a social worker or um, some other professional that is knowledgeable about what is available. Um, social workers have so many tools in their toolbox to help. Mm -hmm. um, and then finding out places, residential communities that accept um, different kind of waivers and different kind of um, payment um, would be something to think about. Yeah. One thing we didn't mention earlier, mm -hmm. probably should have as a good resource, is if you happen um, to have access to the local Parkinson's support group, if you're a yeah. member, mm -hmm. many times um, support group members have had similar experiences and they're mm -hmm. able to share information as well. So that might be another opportunity to kind of bounce some ideas around. Right. To kind of follow up with that, we talked about social workers being kind of the uh, uh, professional that we want to go to. And we talk about Parkinson's needing a very holistic approach to their treatment, right? So we were talking about some of these low-income individuals who uh, aren't able to pay for the resources, and you talked about the state and so on. Um, where could they really go to ask and make sure that they are able to get the support they need? A social worker could certainly help with some of that. Most states in the United States have what's called a board on aging or a state agency. Um, here in Minnesota, there's what's called the senior linkage line. Um, those are typically run by 
um, area agencies on aging, those kinds of places are a wealth of resources um, to help people um, make a determination in their region. Mm -hmm. or their and I think another um, area to think about is um, faith-based communities oftentimes have parish nurses, other resources that can help to link. Sometimes there's even um, members within a faith-based community that will come in the help to into a home to help. That makes sense. Okay. What is your advice about hiring an individual care, in other words, not through an agency? Um, and how do you pay them? Does it come through Social Security? What does that process look like? Yeah, finding a private caregiver is, I think, what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, that can happen. Um, certainly, actually, in the Caring and Coping book that I mentioned earlier through the Parkinson's Foundation, um, I have to say, Joan and I were lucky enough to have a hand in writing that book, so we kind of are familiar what's it, what's in there. But there are some lists of questions to ask a caregiver at the time of an interview mm -hmm. that you kind of know um, good things to ask. Of course, you always want to think about security and safety. Um, you might want to make some consideration about your taxes, about how you're going to pay that person, and and you know if if you can contact you know make that part of your health care. Mm -hmm. So you also want to contact your financial planner as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, and often long-term care policies, insurance policies will pay for help. Um, that comes in, but sometimes you need to use an agency in order yeah. for that um, that to kick in. Um, so that's just another thing to think about. That makes sense. Thank you. Are you seeing any discrimination from facilities due to Parkinson's disease? Um, knowing that it's progressive, do you see any clients that kind of um, have that difficulty or see these clients as future cash flow? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would be really honest to say, I think Joan and I have seen just about everything in our work mm -hmm. with home care agencies and senior living communities. I think there is sometimes um, concern about fall risk in people mm -hmm. with Parkinson's disease. Um, so I think we need to make sure that, that a senior living community um, is willing to uh, provide the assistance and also accept some of that risk because we work very hard to eliminate falls in Parkinson's, but to be honest, we may not be able to eliminate all falls and mm -hmm. we have to be able to think about um, what kind of care and uh, support is available for that. So we're on to our last question. Um, are there federal or state laws that specifically put in legal regulation for the ratio of staff member to residents in these facilities? Yes, there are. And they vary by state and they vary by the level of care. For example, assisted living, a different ratio than a, a long-term care facility versus a memory care unit. They're not the same in every state. So the best way is would be to connect with um, a, the, a, the, your state office to actually get the regulations about what those ratios are in your particular area. Right, and just kind of knowing what that person with Parkinson needs, right? If you said you need the memory care, you may need the smaller racial staff and need that additional. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you both so much for your time today and for joining us to discuss this important topic and to all of our attendees for your participation. We appreciate your feedback on your program today. Please remain right here at the close of the session to complete a brief survey. We'll use these evaluations to plan our future programs. Today's program has been recorded and will be archived on the Parkinson's Foundation YouTube channel within a few days. A link to the recording will be sent to you via email in the coming days, along with the link to complete a program evaluation if you weren't able to do so today. We invite you to participate in our other PD Health at Home events, including Mindfulness Mondays and Fitness Fridays. Please join us again next Wednesday for Understanding Thinking Changes in Parkinson's with Dr. Jennifer Goldman from the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab in Chicago. Visit parkinsons.org, that's PD Health, to learn about upcoming events and to register. 
the Parkinson's Foundation is here for you, please visit our website, www.parkinson.org. And to learn more about our expert care center, research initiative, or to download free educational resources. If you had any questions today that were not answered, please reach out to our free helpline at 1-800-4PD-INFO or email helpline at parkinson.org. You can also contact the helpline to order our free resources, including educational books and our hospital safety kit. We thank you again for joining us today and have a wonderful day.